Welcome to The Sky's the Limit with host D. Brown, the president and CEO of the P3 Group, the nation's largest minority public private partnership real estate developer. Here's D. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Sky's the Limit. Joining me today is Trevor Brown, the Chief Creative Officer for Self Made TV, and my Chief of Staff, Ben Baltimore. Gentlemen, welcome to The Sky's the Limit. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. Hey, listen, today I want to talk about this concept of greatness versus success. Now, I believe that you can be successful and yet not be great. However, you can't be great without being successful. And so that concept stems from the notion that in order to be great, you have to do something that is bigger than yourself. You have to be doing things to further a cause or belief or passion uh, that you have. And so I want to just open the floor to talk to you guys how do you feel about that concept? Then? I definitely agree that greatness, success breeds greatness, but I also agree with your notion that you can't be, um, you, you can be great, you can be great and successful, but you can't be successful and great. Not necessarily, it, it doesn't come automatically. Uh, it does, it's not automatic. And I, and I want to take it back to a statement that I mentioned on um, a professional development call that we had the other day. And I, and I mentioned LeBron James. Mm -hmm. And LeBron James is considered great, but not only is he great because he's a great athlete, not only is he great because he makes a lot of money, and not only is he successful because he's a great athlete and makes a lot of money. What makes LeBron James great is his impact and influence that he has within many generations and many cultures. And I definitely agree with the notion that greatness is, 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 is not something that can be bought or taught. It's definitely something that has to be within you and it has to be um, a fulfillment that you guys are fulfilling. And in, and in LeBron James's case, I definitely agree and feel like he pushes his, his greatness mentality on others and he actually gives us, others the opportunity. So yeah, LeBron James gives others the opportunity to witness success um, coming from, witness success and greatness coming from, you know, um, humble beginnings and a humble background. What do you think, Trevor? You know, I kind of see greatness as a life as a lifestyle. Um, it's something that you have to work towards on a daily basis. Basically, the long nights, the early mornings, and just the way that you, the way that you kind of hold yourself up on a day to day basis, and what you work towards. Just recognizing the weaknesses that you have, the passions that you uh, want to strive for, and just shooting for the stars every single day. Yeah, well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna expand the concept a little bit further to say this. So, when you talk about being successful, you're talking about achieving uh, whether it's financial success, uh, being at the top of your game in your career, uh, you know, doing those things. And there are a lot of successful people that make a lot of money that are at the top of their game, but they're not happy. Mm -hmm. And so, when you talk about being great, you're talking about doing things that really impact lives that really changes uh, variables for a lot of people. And so uh, one, is, one concept is when you think about so Dr. Martin Luther King, he's great. He was never known for being a super wealthy individual, never known for being uh, financially uh, independent. In fact, he became great because he dedicated his life to fighting for a cause that actually ultimately made all of, our, all of our lives better. And a lot of the opportunities that we take for granted now, those opportunities exist because of the sacrifices that he and his family made. And that's what make him great. Absolutely. And so when we talk about being in a situation where uh, you're doing things for causes that are greater than yourself, uh, that brings me to some of our initiatives uh, as a company. Mm -hmm. So we talk about self-made uh, TV mm -hmm. and how we launched that streaming channel to be a platform to offer independent film uh, producers and content creators an outlet to showcase their work to the world. 
without having a lot of the filters and a lot of the manipulation and games that come with traditional Hollywood movie producing, right? So talk to me about self-made TV and, and what you feel our impact could be. Well, I definitely feel that self-made TV is a factor of, of your greatness and our greatness as a team, because as you mentioned, we are we are being we have become a conduit for independent filmmakers and, and independent artists who otherwise would not get their content, you know, out on a wide on a wide widely watched platform, and that just goes to show um, the difference between a successful individual and an individual who strives to be great. And, you know, a successful individual can take care of their family, you know, and maybe a couple families around them, but a great individual actually gives others opportunities to come on and, and, and be some and be a part of something that's bigger than everyone. So Trevor, what do you find most exciting about the self-made television project that we launched? Well, I think the most exciting part about it would be just the fact that we're giving all of the smaller, smaller name directors, producers, and people of color who haven't had that platform to really showcase the creativity, the artistry, and all the hard work that they put into their craft. I think it's really awesome how we're giving them that platform to really just showcase that you know they can do it just as good as anyone else. So right. So Ben, when you uh, started working on the self-made television project mm -hmm. with both of you guys, I mean, you saw it go from being a concept to now being a streaming channel uh, that is available uh, worldwide for right. individuals to watch and enjoy uh, content from hundreds if not thousands of creators. Right. So what have you found to be most interesting about working on the Self-Made TV project, most exciting? Yeah, well, actually my most exciting day of uh, working for Self-Made TV, and it was actually after we had already gone through the soft lunch period, um, I got a call from you saying that um, we we're about to do affiliate program with Apple, where um, Apple TV and I iTunes would provide us with all of their content, and we actually have it on our, you know, black-owned network. And that was that was so powerful to me because I associate myself with Apple's products in so many different ways, from their AirPods to their watches to their music and movies. And now the company that I work with and the comp and the the platform that I've helped build is is integrating Apple's, you know, processes and content into our, you know, right. platform. That was that was huge. Right. Trevor, what about you? What's been the most exciting part of working on self made projects? I would say the most exciting part for me was just basically just learning everything there is to learn about the whole process. Uh, just seeing how all the parts move, seeing how everyone works together as a team and us really just bringing it from the ground up and just making something extraordinary. So uh, I would say that was probably the, my best and most yeah. memorable part. <laughs> yeah, one of the most interesting things to me about Self Made TV, just the, pro the process of from concept to creating uh, the actual network that's live now, is the, is the fact that somewhere in the world, there's someone working on self-made TV. There's some team member working on some aspect of self-made TV to make it better, to make it more robust. 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. There's someone doing some task to make self-made TV bigger, better, stronger. Twenty-four hours a day, seven Literally days a week, every time. And, it, and it's inter interesting for me, you know, <clears throat> leading the organization, is that I know when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, if I look at my email at ten o'clock at night, ten o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the afternoon, there's always communication there related to some aspect of what we're working on, and so that's been something that has been really intriguing to me, you know, being a um, you know, coming out coming out of the real estate development background right. and doing projects uh, around the country and in the Caribbean, you know, so I'm used to dealing with different time zones. Right. Uh, but typically those time zones span uh, a matter of a few hours. Right. But now, you know, <laughs> a lot of hours. Yeah, when we get, when we're laying down, there's people getting up and they're, they're just starting their day, and they're just starting to pick up all the initiatives that we sent to them. Right you know, during our normal work day. And right. the interesting thing is I have to communicate with them right. because I don't want to hold them up. Right. So I have to get up in the middle of the night right. and really look at this stuff and make sure that I'm not holding up no team member right. nowhere else in the world so that we can keep that 
that ball and that process going. Well, that actually leads me into a question that I have for you, Mr. Brown. Um, you know, I've been with the firm a, a, a little over a year and a half, and I have witnessed you just wrangle so much. And I just want to know, you know, from, from real estate development to the yacht that we own um, and operate in, in charter in, in South Florida to self-made TV, how do you, what is the central comp component for you that helps you kind of bring everything together? Trust. Trust. The, the, whole, the whole thing starts with trust. So you, you, you organize a team, mm -hmm. you put the team over a project, and then you trust them to execute it. And now you have to manage your teams. You have to, you know, you got to have checks and balances. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you must have a vision. But the first component is being able to trust someone else with your vision, with your dream. Oftentimes, small business owners can't grow mm -hmm. because they feel like everything that I do, I need to put my hands on it. I need to be there. I need to micromanage it. The reality is the way that you grow your company, the way you grow influence, the, the, the way that you grow ideas is by assembling the most talented in individuals you can find. Mm -hmm. And then you can't be afraid to tap into talent that hasn't been discovered. Mm -hmm. Been one of our greatest tools Absolutely. is being able to find talent that hasn't surfaced and help bring that talent to bear. And so, you know, when you think about all the meetings that go on all day, there's somebody you know, within our team that's meeting on some, whether it's real estate, whether it's TV, whether it's tequila, whether it's clothes, whether it's um, uh, merchandising. There's someone meeting about some facet of what we do every minute of, it, of every day. Mm -hmm. And those, and so I have to trust those teams mm -hmm. to do, you know, to come together, see the vision and be willing to propel that vision uh, forward. And then my job is to, of course, oversee the big picture and then make sure I keep each one of those teams mm -hmm. focusing on tasks. So organization is, you know, skills is very critical because sometimes we get caught up in, I'm going to start working on something and then something comes up here. I'm going to stop. I'm going to jump here or something that's going to pull me here. I'm going to stop and jump there. And then you have a whole bunch of things incomplete. That, that's incomplete. And what I like to do is say, okay, you've seen me do it. I'm going to get right. Let me wrap this up. I'm coming right to you. You know, if it's not, you know, if I don't have to put a fire out, wrap it up. So what was one of your greatest weaknesses uh, starting out and how did you, you know, work towards strengthening that area of weakness? I think the greatest weakness that anyone has in business is being able to understand the difference between what you know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest challenge because when you have a vision, when you have a dream, I think inherently you want to think that since you birthed it, right. you, you have to take it from cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that you could have really, really good ideas and have really, really great visions. But if you can't have the foresight to say, now I'm weak in this area. I'm not good. I, I don't like doing this. So how do I find someone, some entity, you know, to, to plug into my team to take care of these tasks where I can get the best outcomes? And I think my initially, like so many people, I thought that when I developed a dream, I had to take it from cradle to grave. And that was my biggest weakness. And But understanding that empowering people to carry your dream forward, to bring your dream to reality, being able to empower people to do that is your biggest strength. Okay, I have a question for um, aspiring leaders or you know, a, a major organization or CEOs. When you have instances where, of course, you, your central tenant is trust, mm -hmm. but you have people on your team who may not be as competent mm -hmm. as, you, as you expected, how do you, um, and you, and you may become apprehensive about whether or not they are, you know, able to get the job done. How do you deal with that consultation? You know, I think the first element that I try to evaluate with any employee is, number one, loyalty. Mm -hmm. Are they loyal to the cause? Competence is next, but loyalty is first. Right. If this person is really loyal, <clears throat> and I believe that they really are focused 
mm -hmm. on the, delivering our vision, delivering on our goals and objectives, then I look at the loyalty first. Mm -hmm. Then I look at competence and I try to evaluate competence. And so I may hire a person and put them in a position only to determine or learn that that person is not best suited mm -hmm. for that role. Then if they are loyal, they're mission focused, my goal then is to assess their skills and figure out how can I reassign this person mm -hmm. a new role and responsibility or set of responsibilities that are more in line with this individual's skill set. And so sometimes it's about saying, okay, I hired you to do X, Y, Z. You sit the person down and say, look, you're struggling in this area. You're, you're, you're excelling here. I know you can be strong and really add value to the company if we can put you here and you can, you know, we're going to change your title. We're going to give you new, you know, new role, new responsibilities. Uh, and you, but you're going to still be part of the team and you're going to still help us win, but you're going to help us win by doing what you're strong at. And, I, and that's how I try to deal with it. And an individual who is really focused on growth and growing as a person, they'll respect that because you're not going to be successful. If I'm a good running back, I always, I always go back to sports, but if I'm a good running back, uh, don't mean I, I'm going to be a good quarterback. Good and the coach's job is to, you know, when I come to practice and I say I want to try out for quarterback and he see my, my ability to run the ball, he has to be the one to tell me that, hey, Yes, you're better suited to be in the backfield. Mm -hmm. And a perfect example is uh, uh, James Houston that played for Jackson State. When he came to Jackson State, Coach Prime told him, no, 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 no. That's not the position you need to be playing. I need to move you, you know, up. You need to be defensive end. Right. You know, he, he told him, you know, like, you're not going to go where you're trying to go in that position. Mm -hmm. so let me help you get there. Wow. And so it's the same thing in business. That's amazing. Yeah. So... One thing that I was thinking about over here was just kind of recognizing um, what's meaningful to you. And I feel like that's also important when striving for greatness, just mm -hmm. kind of recognizing what your passions are and what makes you, know, what makes you happy and what uh, puts a smile on your face. Because at the end of the day, you're always gonna do better on something that you enjoy. That's true. So, and you're gonna do better on something that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, so when you talk about trying to be great, trying to make a difference, trying, trying to have a passion, a purpose. Those things fuel what you do. Like right. you get up every day and you do what you do, you're doing it for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Like whether it's to provide a better life for your, your family, your kids, uh, whether it's to, to change the lives of your parents, your grandparents, whether it's to provide health care, whatever those goals are, you have to get up and you have to be willing to fight and be able to fight for something other than self gain. Absolutely. I mean, because at the end of the day, it, it's, doing it for yourself is just not good enough. Mm -hmm. It's just not good enough. It's, it's gotta be bigger than it yourself. It has to be bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think that's just a prerequisite. Right. 100% is never enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, 150. right. 150%. <laughs> so guys, listen, I appreciate you joining me on this episode of The Sky's the Limit. It's been real. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you for watching this episode of The Sky's the Limit. This has been The Sky's the Limit with D. Brown, CEO. To find out more about D, go to dbrownceo.com or Google D. Brown CEO. To connect with the P3 Group, check out the P3 Group Inc.com. The Sky's the Limit is a self made TV original production.